All right, today we're talking about an electrical subcode primit application. In order to fill out the application, you need to have certain information known. Uh, when you purchased the house, you would have been given the block and lot number. So the block and lot number are used to identify your house within a series of within a series of maps that are maintained by your city or township. So typically the the block would be something like a 12.06 and the lot number could be like a 22. Uh, the worksite location, you would put your address. So we could put one, two, three, let's say Philadelphia. So this is where the work is gonna be performed. The owner is you. Uh, then you're gonna have your telephone number. This is where they can reach you because they need to call you and tell you that your permit's ready. Your email address. Um, some townships don't email. The address. Now this could be the, the same address. Contractor. So you're doing the work yourself. Uh, you just put self. Real easy. You don't need to fill in any of this information. None of this is applicable because you're doing the work yourself. Now, let's assume we're doing some work within your residence. Let's take uh, my music studio uh, as an example. So the music studio that I'm working on, we have approximately 12 outlets. I originally spec'd 12 lights, but because of the way everything was laid out, it worked better with 10 lights. And we have five switches. Now we do not have to count existing switches. There was a closet in that room and there's a switch in that room. We do not need to count that because this is rehab work. We're rehabbing the, the room. So switches, we're gonna say we have five switches. Uh, receptacles, we're gonna say 12. Lighting fixtures, we're gonna say 10. Uh, detectors, uh, yes, we are gonna add smoke detectors because the, the previous the previous homeowner did not have wired smoke detectors. The house was built in 1972. Uh, the requirements then were that you only needed a smoke detector. I don't even think you needed a smoke detector then. But because it was built in 1972, the requirement is that a smoke detector be present for a CO, which is Certificate of Occupancy. But the smoke detector needs to only be battery powered. So I am wiring up, or I did wire up uh, detectors. And the number of detectors, I did one in the hallway and one in the studio just for safety purposes. And they are hardwired to a dedicated circuit. And now we have a sub panel that we added. We have one, one sub panel, it's 100 amp that we added. Uh, technically this was added for another permit that I pulled, but I'm just doing it on here just so that you see. We have the fixtures, receptacles, switches, detectors, Sub panels. Now we need the estimate of the work. Cost of the estimated work, it's me doing it so there's no labor involved, but there are parts. And the switches, um, outlet outlets are cheap. Okay, 10 outlets are about uh, $10. So we'll say $20 for the outlets. Just do some quick math here. You do, you do not need to fill in this area. I'm gonna use this just for a scratch pad. So $20 for outlets. Probably about uh, $10 for switches. Wire was about $56. I used 20, uh, 20 amp capable wire, which is 12.2. 12 12.2 12 wire, $56. Then uh, we have the sub panel itself, which was about $70. Breakers. I went with uh, AFCI, GFCI. They're about $45. So that's ninety dollars because I have two of them, and we have Romex connectors, miscellaneous uh, clips, uh, wire nuts, etc. I'm gonna say that's a uh, ten dollars in those materials. So you can see we can add this up. So we got sixty, one twenty, one thirty. So that's two hundred sixty dollars, right? So this is all you have to do for the electrical filling out a permit, but you do need to. Describe your work. So I had a, a couple of steps here. Uh, the first thing was it's a it's a rehab of existing room to bring to code current code. 
So the code for a room is the 612 rule. And the 612 rule is that there can be no more than six foot between an outlet and a corner and another outlet if the wall is two feet or greater and no more than 12 feet between outlets on any one wall. So if you have a 30 foot wall, you will need probably three outlets um, and then adjacent outlets on the or outlets on the adjacent wall. So, so you'll say C drawing and the drawing, uh, I'm going to save this document so I don't lose what I created here. Uh, drawing is real easy. I'll show you how to do an electrical drawing next. Now what happens is you submit this permit and this permit has a certain uh, dollar amount associated with it. Uh, there's academic and then there's reality. So academic is this process right here. You are estimating the amount of work and based on this, they have a threshold for a permit, depending on the, the type of work it is. So no matter what, even if you said it was two outlets you're adding, they're probably going to charge you a hundred and some dollars for the permit. Maybe there's a certain threshold that when you say you're adding 20 outlets, it may go up to 120 or 130. So you tell them what you think you're going to do. And then what happens is when they come through a final inspection, uh, they're going to assess what you have, uh, write it, record it. And then the way that it is is what's going to get submitted to, the, to your city or county for final assessment. And it's the final assessment uh, that will determine if your taxes will go up or not. Because they need to be fair. Um, and it depends on the township. I, I know that there's some states where no matter what you do to a house, your taxes will not go up. Your property taxes will always remain constant. In New Jersey, at least in our township, that's not the way it is. You make improvements to your house, uh, you will be taxed accordingly. So the electrical permit, what you need to do is you need to draw the layout of the room. So we'll do that now. So this is the room, draw the doorway. This is the doorway we have. This is the music studio I'm working on. You can see it on YouTube, doorway. Uh, so you need to mark the location of lights. So look, lights are drawn in this fashion. This is the way we installed the lights. This was not what was on plan, by the way. What was on plan was 12 lights. Here we only have 10 lights. All right, so the next thing, we have switches. So you have to show the switches. Switches are shown almost like a dollar sign. And you can mark them two, three, four. And we could say this is controlled by S1. Say it's controlled here and here. One, we can do a different color for S2, two, from here and here. So now what this shows is that S2 is responsible. And of course you need electric to go to that switch. And they understand that when they're looking at your application. Let's go with green. We'll say S3 and we'll have these two wired up. Change this to three. Go with yellow. Let's these two. Let's call this S4. Change that to a four. All right, then we have to show outlets. One of the things we need to do is document uh, the length of the wall. So we can say that this is 17 feet from here, there. So that's 17 feet here, seven, five foot. Just the indication for the width of the room. So now you know you have 17 feet. Now what I did was I put an outlet center. There was only one outlet on this wall. That was the way that the code was at the time. And then I put another outlet down here, one outlet here, but because this is going to be where computer equipment is, I did a double outlet. Same thing over here, double outlet, did an outlet here, here, and an outlet here. We do not need an outlet here because this is a closet space. And technically I should draw that this closet. And this is an open doorway. Yep, so there's the existing closet. So this kind of draws a picture so that they can understand what you're going to do. Now, the other thing you need to do on a drawing is you can indicate what circuits there are. So uh, there's a requirement for a smoke detector. I All right, so the smoke detector, we have close to this area here, a square box, SD. 
And we can say that this is a hallway. What we have? We have a hallway. And we can draw the uh, smoke detector detector. And we will choose a different color. Description now. So you list your circuits uh, one 20 amp for outlets, 20 amp lighting, and we have one 15 amp for smoke detector. Now, the township can have additional rules beyond what the NEC guideline states, but the NEC guideline does not state how many receptacles uh, you are or are not allowed to have. So you can do, you can have as many as you want. I wouldn't. Um, so what I do is I limit it to a room. So now that we have this drawing, this is the drawing that we would submit with the permit. So this is one part of a series that I need to explain uh, for the permitting process. But now I'm going to go a step further and talk about the electrical so that you have an understanding of capacity and the requirements associated with it. So the service that I have is what's called a 150 amp service. All right, so my service on my panel, I have a 150 amp panel. And that 150 amp panel has a main breaker, main breaker that's rated for, guess what, 150 amps. That guards against uh, two things, overloading or short. And they're both similar. Overloading would mean that you know, there's, there's some fudge factor. Maybe it can exceed 150 amps, maybe by 5% or so. So let's say it requires 155 or 160 amps to trip the main breaker. So if you're pulling 151 amps, first off, you're probably going to notice a hum. You're probably going to hear your electric with a 60 hertz hum, and it's a very unique. Uh, you'll you'll definitely hear that. Um, let's say you go to 170 amps because everything is turned on, and you're, which it's not impossible, but it it's rare, but it it could happen depending upon what you're running. That will trip the main breaker. So that's an overloading condition. You could have another situation in which the panel itself fails and line one and line two of the 240 volts come in contact with one another and create a dead short. In that case, that's going to be an instantaneous mother load of current coming through that breaker and that breaker better trip because otherwise you're going to have a definite fire. So there are the two things that this guards against. Now, your breaker, your load center, it's called a load center, a panel, a main panel, a breaker panel. We used to use fuses. Some places still use fuses. I don't know if you've ever seen a screw in fuse. And they're for the individual breakers. So then you have breakers. And breakers are typically 15 amp, 20 amp. You'll have a 30 amp. Uh, you could have more. I have 100 amp. I'll explain why I have 100 amp. So your 30 amp is typically going to be for an oven, heater, uh, electric heater, like one I just installed. And you can see that in one of my videos. Uh, 20 amp is going to be for bathroom, typically. Uh, but I like using 20 amp anywhere throughout the house. I'd rather use 20 amp than use 15 amp breakers. I don't mind spending the extra 2 to $3 for a breaker. And the extra is six to ten dollars for a roll of twelve two wire. Then you have uh, fifteen amp breakers, and this is typically lighting uh, and outlets. So the panel I have is a twenty slot panel, twenty slots. And in that panel, there's definitely a couple of 30s. So right there, we're at 60. Uh, we have two 20s. This is 60 amps. This is 40 amps. 40 amps total. But then we have a series of 15 amp breakers, and I'd say that we have... Uh, at least 10 15 amp breakers so that's 150 amps right there 
So let's add this up. So we're at 190, 250 amps. So you're going to ask yourself, well, how is this possible? How can I have a panel where I have the number of breakers with total amperage exceeding what the service, the main breaker provides? Well, now we have to talk about loads. So yes, each breaker is capable of providing its maximum plus maybe a little fudge factor amount of power at any given time. Consider your own house. What are the chances of you overloading everything? Hey, let's say you have a party and you have every light on in the house. Well, if you're using incandescent lights, okay, and they're 100, let, let's say that they're incandescent and they're 100 watt bulbs, right? And let's say that you have five bulbs per room. That's really killing it. Let's say that that's the case. That's what you have uh, times five. And let's say that you have uh, three bedrooms. Uh, family room, living room, kitchen, two bathrooms. So you're talking 10, 10 rooms, right? Times 10. So we're talking 50, we're talking 5,000 watts power, right? Just for the bulbs. Now, what does that watts convert to? There's a B equals IV, right? That's power. So we're going to convert uh, watts, 5,000 watts, divided by voltage, which is 120, that's what the V is, equals our current, which this is going to be what? So let's say it's uh, 40, 40 amps. So that's roughly 40 amps. It's actually a little bit more, but it's an approximate amount. So we're consuming 40 amps just in lighting. Now let's talk about heater let's say you have your heater on and your heater is you know it's on a 30 amp breaker but let's say that the heater is only pulling 20 amps so now we're at 60 amps and then let's say you run your oven and let's say that that's running at 15 amps uh, you have to clean up something so you're running your vacuum or somebody's running the vacuum right Let's say that that's uh, 10 amps. Uh, at the same time, you got your air compressor kicking it on because it just happens to be that it ran out of air overnight and it just decides to fill up right when you have this big party. And that could be like a 10 amp a draw. And that's an air compressor in a workshop. Um, at the same time, someone's running the microwave. And let's say that that's a 10 amp draw. And the refrigerator is running. Say so that's a 10 amp draw. So let's add this up. So we have 40 amps, 60, right? Let's round this up to 20, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120. So we're getting close. We're not there yet, but you know, we're at 120 amps of 150. So yes, it is possible that you can completely overload the panel. But that's not reality. Let's talk about now with LED lighting. So this 100 watts is no longer a 100 watt bulb. It's the equivalent of 100 watts of incandescent lighting lumens. But let's say you have the LEDs, which pull about 10 watts a bulb. And let's say we do have 15 bulbs. So if we multiply this up, we're talking 150 watts being consumed which is approximately which is less than two amps so just to say it's approximately two amps power because we divide 150 by 120 and it's less than two greater than one so look two amps compared to uh, 40 amps right so that's where we have our savings that's one case right there we have a reduction of let's just say this 40 amps goes away so now we're down to 110 that's our new number all right so now i want to add a sub panel so we have our main panel 150 amps i want to add a sub panel right next to it okay the sub panel here the main panel here is 20 slots i have two free slots open i put in a 100 amp breaker here and i run that wire over to here 
And this also has a 100 amp breaker. I really didn't need to do it this way. I like to have to switch in both places. Now, I also have 20 slots here. I could completely overload this with a bunch of circuits. If I put in 10, 15 amp breakers, do the math. 10, 15 amps, that's 150 amps. I already exceeded the capability of this. But not everything's going to be on at the same time. Inspections, right? So your inspections, you have, for electrical, you have two inspections for electrical. You could have more if you fail. You have what's called a rough. And then you have final. This is electrical. You also have building. Building consists of framing. Let's assume you do not have to deal with plumbing. I did not have to deal with any plumbing, so I'm not going to talk about it. You have framing. You have insulation. And then you have final. The insulation could also talk about fire blocking. And it should. We're not covering that here. So we're only really talking about the electrical here. So before you get to the final of electrical and final of building, you have to go through a couple steps. So this is step one. You have to do the rough electrical first. And the reason why is because after you do the rough electrical, the inspector may have identified that you need to do some additional wiring, and that could result in moving of studs, cutting, drilling, and it's basically changing your framing. So that's why you do the rough electrical first, and then you have to have the placard available that the inspector signed and show that to the next inspector as proof, because depending on the size of the township or city, one's not going to know the other. It, the department could be so large that they may only talk to each other maybe once every month or once a year. They may not even see each other. So the next step is framing. So you would do that. If you're lucky, like I was, I had the framing and insulation done. Uh, I even documented in my video what I which I didn't publish that video yet, um, where I fire blocked everything. I used Roxul everywhere. I used the fire blocking foam everywhere. And I even used the uh, 3M fire blocking caulk through annular openings. So then you would have your insulation and fire blocking. Then you would have final electrical inspection, which I did not do yet because it's still a work in progress. And then you would have your final uh, building inspection. Now, these two are what gets sent to your, essentially the tax assessor, whether it's something that is managed within uh, the township or city, or if it's something that's managed at a county level. So for us, the tax assessment's managed at the county level. So the final results, uh, of this and it could be that they look at well your number of outlets so number of outlets number of lights type of lighting is a factor so if it's like if you literally spend five thousand dollars on a light fixture you could probably tell them it's a thousand but they're going to see that and they're going to say, yeah, that's not a $50 light fixture. It's more like a thousand. Uh, so they would, they would say that you just upgraded your lighting for a thousand dollars. Uh, so type of lighting, uh, the room layout, any improvements that you made. So the flooring, you know, wall covering, the so flooring could be hardwood carpet, you know, carpet would obviously be the cheapest if you did a laminate, uh, wood versus hardwood, you know, that may have an impact for what they send to the county. So these final results are tallied up by the inspector and paperwork is submitted to the, the township or city and it goes to the tax assessor. And the tax assessor takes that and um, 
determines if your taxes are going to increase at the uh, at the beginning of the the next year, and you may see a tax increase because of this, or you may not. So I hope this was uh, helpful to you. Uh, you. You do have to be aware that if you do work without pulling a permit, and something were to happen, let's say that there were a fire, and it that fire could have been traced to the improvements that you made. Insurance companies are really good at not paying. So the insurance company would essentially reject uh, payment because you did not follow the law. And that's a legal standing that insurance companies use over and over again. So you need to make sure you apply for permits and you follow code properly. So if a fire does occur, even while you're working on your own property, or some major catastrophe happens or a floor caves in or something that you didn't anticipate, as long as you had the permit, kind of demonstrates to the insurance company that you were doing everything legally, so the insurance company can't pull the rug from under you, at least in that case. Now here's something else to consider. Let's say you did all this work and you know, 10 years go by and, with, and you, didn't, you didn't do this without a permit. I mean, you, you did the work without pulling a permit. Let's say a fire were to occur. And it had nothing to do with the work that you did. It just it was a fire in another room, and they deemed the cause because of uh, a faulty appliance or something like that. The insurance company has the right to restore the house to its original look it, if you didn't pull the permits. So that means potentially thousands, tens of thousands of dollars of materials and not labor, but it's your sweat. Um, would be lost as a result of that. So if you pull a permit and you make the improvement, uh, they're likely to build it, including that. But there's one other caveat. You have to tell your insurance company that these improvements have been made to the building so that they can adjust your premium according to the improvements that you made. When you sign up for insurance, you're paying for a premium based on the property, the way it was when you purchased it. Any improvements that you make to the property along the way, if they're minimal, it's not that big of a deal. They'll they'll come along for the ride. Uh, but otherwise, you need to inform the insurance company that you made certain improvements, and they'll determine if your rate or premium needs to increase or not based on those improvements. Let's say that you added a, an addition that's a 40-square-foot addition. Yeah. That's not practical. Let's say you added a 100 square foot addition. So, so to wrap up here, applying for a permit covers you and locks you in to the code at the time that the permit was filed. So if the code changes, which it does from year to year, it could change. If you were to apply, if you were to do the work now and then 10 years from now, apply for the permit, you may have to rip out a lot of stuff and redo things. Uh, the other thing applying for a permit does is helps ensure that the work is done not entirely because the inspectors truthfully don't have a lot of time to go through every inch of your work, but they have a good eye and they can spot meticulous work and they can spot crappy work. Uh, if they see that your work is meticulous and they're looking at it and things look good, they're probably going to give you a pass on the rough inspection and then in the final. But you want to have that rough inspection. You need that rough inspection first by law. That allows the inspector to say you fail, and some inspectors don't even bother telling you why. In my opinion, they should. Uh, you can then go to their manager and ask for, you know, a reason why. But it's real easy. You need to follow the NEC guidelines and the ICC, which is the International Construction Code that was adopted by your city or town. It's literally not rocket science. You just have to read. The spec. You can't undergo any of this without understanding the spec. You can definitely consult somebody you know who's in construction uh, to get an idea about certain things, but you need to read standards so that you know what to do by law. Once you are approved at the rough, then you can go through with the final and everything along the way, as long as you're going through the permit, you're going to be okay with the insurance company. Uh, don't skip on any of those items. Make sure that everything is approved and done properly. And along the way, you want to make sure that you do things safely.
So I go through a lot of things and it's really an academic exercise. What I just did here, executing this, it's a different story because you have to drill holes. You have to cut things. You have to install wiring. You're dealing with stuff that can shock you, electrocute you. Um, you know, you can lose a limb. You can uh, fall off a ladder. There's a lot of hazards. So keep all that in mind when you're working. And uh, if you like this video and you want to see more of it, which I am going to do more of it anyway, uh, but if you want to see more of it and if this was helpful to you, please leave a comment. And if you think I missed anything, definitely leave a comment and we can address it in the comments. I can have an overall comment where I have addendums to this and then perhaps make a, a second revision of the video. Give me your thoughts and your experiences. Did you ever finish uh, a room or do any work without a, an inspection and then it hurt you later? Um, I know in my township, uh, they look at the paperwork based on the way that the house was prior to sale and they compare it um, to what it is now at the time of sale. And if they notice a significant change or something that stands out, let's give you an example, finish basements. Uh, you can finish a basement in your house and nobody would know. You bring in the materials at night. Well, when you go to sell the house, a finished basement is something that's going to stand out because guess what? When the house was purchased, it did not come with a finished basement. So they would get you at that point and that could halt a sale. And you would have to have that in your disclosure whether or not you applied for permits. So you would want to get all that straightened out prior to selling your home. Go through an inspection process and I can take you through that. And, and I will take you through that because that was an experience that I had in my previous home. I went through the inspection process prior to listing my house at a house that I literally thought I was going to retire at. But, you know, we, we moved into a smaller home. So again, uh, give it a thumbs up if you liked it. Thumbs down if you didn't. Uh, interact with me, leave a comment, and uh, make sure, most importantly, you subscribe and look back for uh, new content. So thank you for watching.